Birds watch flocks by night, downcast hearts and weary eyes. Heavenly hosts fill up the sky, angels sing of brightest light. Glory to God on high, harmony still echoing through time. And we've been waiting for so long just to. City Life. Hi, my name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, happy uh, belated Thanksgiving. i uh, so glad that you can join us today for worship. I hope your bellies are full. Uh, you had a good weekend with friends and family, and um, it's good to be with all of you here this morning. Uh, some of you know today marks the beginning of the season of Advent. And if you're wondering what that means, the word Advent is this Latin word that means arrival. So essentially, as Christians, every year around this time of the year, we celebrate uh, uh, for a whole month, the leading up to the arrival of Jesus' birth at Christmas. And so today, as we begin Advent, as we prepare for Jesus' arrival on Christmas in worship, we're, on the one hand, ref- invited to reflect on his arrival, and on the other hand, we're also invited to reflect where do we still long for more of him today? Where do you long for more of Jesus' presence in your life? Uh, So before we begin this morning, I want to actually invite you, uh, take a moment to reflect on that question and ask Jesus, where do I long for you today, right now in my life, uh, before we respond to him in worship? So will you please uh, take a minute to go before the Lord in preparation?
The good news of Advent is that when we long for him, when we wait for him, when we seek him, every single time he shows up. And he shows up with a call to worship, which we have an opportunity uh, to respond to. So if you'll please stand, I'll lead us in the part of the minister, and let's go to him this morning as we respond with the part of the people. Uh, Let us praise our Lord Jesus Christ. At Christmas, Jesus came as a baby. He came to be like us because he loves us. He came to save us from our sin. He died, rose from the dead, and lives in heaven. He will come again because he loves us. We praise Jesus who came as a baby and will come again at the end of time. Alleluia, Jesus is coming. Uh, So today is the first Advent candle, and today's theme is love. So prepare the way of the Lord. We light this candle in love, the love of our coming Savior, Jesus. Prepare then the way of the Lord. If you'll please remain standing, we'll respond with our first hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High. Oh! 
seats. Uh, if you're just joining us now for worship, welcome. Um, as you can see, uh, today is a special Sunday. We've been saying that today uh, marks the beginning of the season of Advent. Uh, so every Sunday we're going to have uh, different genres of music just celebrating uh, this beautiful season where we anticipate the arrival of Jesus. And today is our classical service. Uh, but we also said that today's Advent theme is a theme of love. You know, the arrival of Jesus into the world on Christmas is all about God's love, his love for sinners, his love for people like you and me. Uh, so now as we enter a time of corporate worship, of uh, corporate confession of sin, our, confess- our confession, which we'll read together in a moment, begins with this line, if you'll listen. We confess our willingness to be loved, but also our reluctance to love. We confess our willingness to be loved, but also our reluctance to love. Do you agree with that statement? Are you willing and ready to receive love, yet reluctant and resistant to love others? If so, here in confession, it's only appropriate that we ask ourselves this question. Who in my life today, who are the people in my life right now that I am reluctant and resistant to love? Your roommates, your spouses, your family members, your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, even people here in this very own church community. But also another question we're invited to ask is how do we get to a place where we can love others well and love others rightly? And the answer to that question is through this practice called corporate confession. Because before we can become a people who love well, we first need to be a people who are honest that we're often the worst people at it. Not just the people outside of these walls, but all of us here in this room. But secondly, we need to be a people who humbly admit that we can't do this on our own. But we need a love from the outside that makes its way into our hearts to change us that we might love well. 
And so this morning, this is what corporate confession invites us into, to experience the love of Jesus so that we might go out into the world and love others like him. Uh, so be, as we do this this morning, we have an opportunity uh, to corporately confess this together um, and take some time in silence uh, for personal confession. Uh, but we'll uh, do this together as we uh, recite the corporate confession. If you'll please join me. Lord Christ, we confess our willingness to be loved, but also our reluctance to love. We confess our readiness to accept your forgiving love, but also our refusal to forgive. We confess our eagerness to grasp your offer of redeeming love, but also our resistance to follow you without question. In this Advent time, forgive us our failure to respond as we should. Come to us anew, and by your grace, assist us to receive you with joy, as the shepherds with gratitude, as Simeon with obedience, as Mary with love as you have loved us. Even so, come Lord Jesus, amen. Uh, now take this time to go before God in personal confession. Would you lift up your heads and receive this word of grace? Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Hear these words one more time. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Now, this is good news. Every week when we come to God as sinners, he meets us with his grace. He renews us in his love. Uh, if you'll please respond to this love as we stand and sing the doxology. If you'll please join us.
Thank you for, oh, oh, hello. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you for your patience and standing. We're going to stand a little longer. <laughs> Please bow your heads with me. God, this first Sunday of Advent, we thank you so much for not abandoning, abandoning us in our despair, in our sickness, in our sin, um, in our self-centeredness. Uh, we pray, God, for um, an understanding of what it means to be in the already but not yet, knowing that you have promised us eternity, um, but being incredibly overwhelmed by the things um, in our lives and in front of us. We take time now to pray for those in despair. We pray for those who, um, I, especially after being at L Street Mission yesterday, I pray for those who um, are struggling with trauma and mental health and addiction issues, who um, have been needing your word more than anyone, um, but have trouble seeing that grace and compassion because of all of the hardships that block their view. We pray for their souls and the ones and the souls that have and the souls that have passed in the last year. <clears throat> we pray for the grieving um, for those of us who have parents with um, physical illnesses. We pray for those who are struggling with um, sickness. We lift up it. Riley, who is going through a pretty long haul of a treatment process. We pray for our brother, Ron, that he will continue to make progress um, in being able to sit up and walk. And all of those of us who are struggling with the reality that this world is not our home and that our bodies break down in this environment, we pray for the grieving. We pray for the people who lost loved ones in the mass shootings at Virginia and Colorado Springs. We pray for healing over um, a country that seems polarized and where um, loving and compassionate conversation seems almost impossible. But God, we thank you that we can pray for all of these hard things with hope. We Thank you for um, making us resurrection people who believe that the end is already written and inevitable and that you uh, have the victory and, and so do we. We also thank you that you are, that the kingdom is advancing and you continue to do miracles in the world today. We repent for the ways that we have made you small and made Jesus in service of our own lives because you are doing miracles and we ask that you just help us not to be like the Pharisees who upon seeing the healed seeing the captives free could only ask whether you should be doing those things on the Sabbath so God change us make us your agents of healing and and people who embody the word because you are anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, and liberty for the oppressed. So we too proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and we uh, pray your words that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please have a seat. Oh. Whew. Okay. Um, oh, so if you are new, Welcome. We are so happy to have you. I don't know, did everybody have a good Thanksgiving weekend? I hope you did. I uh, 
we did too, lots of eating. Um, so if you're new, please fill out a Connect card. Uh, as we say every week, there's a tablet outside that you can fill in, or it, it's in the back of the digital bulletin. There's a link for you, and that's a way to get connected to various ministries and to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Next week, we are on the sixth floor, so you'll, you'll know because there will be nobody down here if you come here by accident. And then we are going to have our second round of community dinners um, for, if I think most of you will remember, but part of our vision statement is to be a diverse community of believers. And uh, diversity is not just like having different kinds of people sitting in a room together, but it takes intentionality and work and a little bit of awkwardness. So um, this is a way to get connected with people you haven't seen before. There's a sign up uh, on Church Center or our weekly newsletter. And this is just a way like, you know, not as Karina had said before, not entertaining. Uh, don't go crazy trying to clean your house because I know that is for me a big obstacle. <laughs> to inviting people, um, but that it is a potluck and we will just be together and, and you'll be randomly assigned to uh, people that uh, have signed up for, for that. And again, that's December 10th and 11th. Uh, and then the women's ministry will be hosting um, a Christmas gift bag drive and packing party. So if you guys remember, Route One is a ministry that we partner with and they proclaim the, the love of Christ to sexually exploited women by going into strip clubs in all over Massachusetts and, um, and trying to develop relationships and, and try to proclaim their dignity as image bearers and eventually to kind of try to pull them out of that life. Um, and so every Christmas they have a big like event, not an event, but like a real big effort to bring Christmas gift bags with like cute things like hats and lipstick and mugs and, and, and they distribute it to the strip clubs they go to. And it's kind of a way they start like initiate relationship with some of these women who, you know, are not really excited to meet like Christian <laughs> ladies who come into the strip club. Um, and, and it's been, you know, it's, it's an amazing ministry and I'm so thankful that our lay leaders for the women's ministry have been willing to do this. So this is gonna happen Saturday, December 10th uh, from four to six. And you can either purchase the items, there's an Amazon wish list, and that link is in your bulletin in the weekly newsletter, or you just register and show up. Um, we should be able to cover, if you, please don't let the, the, the expense be an obstacle um, because we can cover um, you know, if you just want to, like, just show up and participate and make these bags, uh, the expenses can be covered by the Neighborhood Outreach Fund. So, so I hope that we will um, be able to come together and make these gift bags for some of our most vulnerable women. Um, yeah, and so that's it for announcements. Can I have our kiddos stand up and we'll pray for you? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I, Eric, oh, there you are. That, I'm going to invite Eric up for an announcement from the Pastor Search Committee. Eric, that doesn't work. You have to come here. It oh, it does? Okay, never mind. Um, we're asking for your prayers for, uh, for today and tomorrow, because tomorrow at 8 o'clock we're going to have a very, very important meeting, and it's extremely, extremely likely that we will be voting. Uh, and um, it's an extremely important vote. And if it goes through, there'll be a two to three week period of process in which we will continue to pray. And then we will have another vote, a main vote, um, which you guys will vote um, to, um, to elect Ben. So it just depends on what happens tomorrow night. So um, please keep City Life in prayer. Please keep the committee in prayer. And um, you'll, know, um, you'll know soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Sorry, I almost forgot you. Uh, okay, kids, we're gonna stand up and we're gonna pray for you before you go out. Please pray with me. Um, God, we thank you so much for this time to just carve out for our youngest members um, and to lift them up in prayer. Um, they are our first mission field. 
uh, to be sharing the word of, of God, of Christ, and we are um, so grateful that we have so many of them, such a big mission field. Um, and as the toddlers um, learn about your incredible power um, through the Wall of Jericho story, Jericho story and our elementary school kids learn about your faithfulness in promising, um, in keeping your promises to us and that you are so patient with us even when we are, when we are so selfish and sometimes um, aren't thinking about you and following you at all. So God, um, will you move in our kids' hearts? Will you be speaking through our teachers? And will you equip our community to always be um, pouring out the love of Christ to our youngest members? And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you're joining us from out of town for the holiday weekend, we're so glad that you're here. Um, one of the ways that we would love to get to know you is, is through this part of religion where we extend the peace of Christ. Uh, as God invites us into the household of God, uh, we welcome one another, greet one another by extending peace. Uh, so I'll lead us in the part of the ministry if you'll please respond with the part of the people. Uh, since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Uh, if you'll please stand and extend the peace of Christ to those around you. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Please remain standing as you are able as we read God's word. The scripture today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving again, too. Um, I'm sure some of you are coming out of town. I, I, I'm sure uh, our, our regulars are also out of town going to their places, but I'm sure some of us are here uh, that are not normally in Boston. So welcome. Uh, Happy Thanksgiving to you. And as Daniel mentioned, first Sunday of Advent. Um, four weeks of preparation leading up to the day of Christmas, coming of Jesus, and we're essentially joining in with the saints of the Old Testament to wait for uh, this Savior to come, the promised one to come. So we'll pause in our regular Acts series uh, for some time, and then we'll actually go into this short sermon series as we begin uh, the four Old Testament passages that are uh, typically hinted 
a lot to tell about the coming of Jesus as we see in the New Testament, uh, starting with Genesis 3 today. Theologian Alec Modia actually says this. He says, it can be said the whole of Scripture is the unfolding of Genesis 3.15. All of Scripture is the unfolding of Genesis 3.15. Now, I say that not to just hype this up, to give a trailer for this sermon. He said it. And that's because throughout church history, this passage has been called Proto-Euangelion, which means proto first Euangelion gospel. Genesis 3.15 has historically been named as the first gospel, the first mentioning of the good news of the one to come, the promised one to come to then deliver us, that the message of deliverance, the message of goodness and new hope is not a New Testament invention, but that it has been told from the very beginning. Genesis 3.15, Proto-Euangelion here. So what does that mean for us? What is that, how does that shape the way that we ought to wait in our Advent season, in all of our waitings in our lives, individually and corporately together? So three things as we look at this first gospel, Genesis 3.14 and 15, to give us some context. First, curse. Second, enmity. And lastly, promise. Curse, enmity, promise. Take a look at the first point with me, curse. So verse 14, that's where we are. Genesis 3, 14, some context here. The fact that we have a curse means the backdrop of that has to mean that there is a blessing, right? A curse is a curse because it's coming at the backdrop of a blessing. So what is that blessing we have in Genesis 1 and 2, leading up to Genesis 3 as we have it here? Genesis 1 and 2 tells a story of creation that God looked at and said it was very, very good. Let there be this, it was good. Let there be this, it was good. Let there be mankind, it was very, very good. Shalom, a biblical word for that. Peace, harmony, goodness, flourishing, blessing. That's the scene, that's the backdrop that we have in Genesis 1 to 2, leading up to our context here in the curse in Genesis 3. Now, let me pause there to make this point here real quick, as a, as a, as a quick note of application. The backdrop of the, bless, that the backdrop of the curse being the blessing, therefore, our origin, our starting place of mankind and creation is a blessing has to mean this. It means that we as Christians ought to be the most optimistic kind of people on earth. Because the belief is that we are not the result of a bunch of accidents coming together, clashing together, and voila, there is life happening. And it's all by happenstance. It's all random, and we're trying to make meaning as we go in this life. Just trying to make the best of it all, whatever best means. We belong to a creator who had a vision in mind, with a design in mind, with an origin in mind to say, I am here and let there be this and it is for your flourishing. That we belong to a God who has a vision of flourishing for us. And if that were to be the case, if our origin is goodness, if our origin, if our starting place is flourishing, blessing, then we ought to follow the scriptural vision and impulse to see that hope can always be there, that the God of creation who said and there was can still be the God who can bring everything together to make wholeness happen again. We ought to be the most optimistic kind of people on earth. That's what Genesis 1 and 2, our origin story, tells us. But, right, there's a but there. But, Genesis 3, mankind's disobedience against God of creation, what seems like a silly story, or that's children's version of it, whatever the case might be, what seems like a silly story of Adam and Eve taking a bite out of the apple, forbidden fruit. But there's much more that's jam-packed in there. 
that narrative. Because it captures the heart of God's vision for us, for our flourishing. That's the design. And yet, our active rejection of that vision, believing in a lie that we can successfully be our own gods, cultivating our own vision of flourishing, and that we have it good here, and that we can make that work for myself and for others. We got this, God. Thank you for creating us. But now is the time for me to find my own vision of flourishing and for others. We are fully capable, believing in that lie, the rejection, the active rejection of that happening in the fall. Hence, sin, disobedience, disharmony, disunity, breakdown of that vertical relationship and the horizontal, the fall. So what happens as a result of this fall, mankind's active disobedience against God's vision of flourishing, there are consequences. Hence, curse. You tracking with me? Okay. And to that, we can say this. Well, that's kind of harsh. No, like, warning or anything. But friends, isn't it true that if God were to exist... If he is real, we would want him and we would need him to be just. We can't have a wishy-washy God. We can't have a God who doesn't take his own words seriously. Uh, I was just joking. We can't have a push over God. And then a follow-up question to that, well, what about mercy? Then what about forgiveness? Then what about grace? What about the nice part of God? Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. But that's how we get to and why we are here at verse 14 where curse is being pronounced first to the serpent, then to Eve, then to Adam. And God says this to the serpent, verse 14. Because you, the serpent, have done this. What is this? Deceiving of Eve, right? And what's the rightful, because we don't have a pushover God and a wishy-washy God, what's the rightful and just consequence of that reality? Cursed. Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. You are responsible for this, God is saying. The justice of God kicking in here. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Your life will be marked by lowliness on the ground, collecting up dust. So the presence of the curse means this. While we ought to be the most optimistic kind of people because our starting origin is of blessing and flourishing, a vision of our goodness that is established for us by the word of God, the presence of the curse here in verse 14 has to mean at least this too, that we ought to be the most alert people too. We ought to be the most optimistic people because he has created it all and he has the power to then do that again in redemption and yet we ought to be the most alert people because of sin. That this isn't just a, 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 a misstep here and there. This isn't just, okay, that's all right. But that we have actively disobeyed, disconnected, and therefore sin, therefore the fall. Everything is tainted. We are all created, and yet we are all fallen. Do you see? We ought to be most optimistic, and yet we ought to be most alert. That's the reality before us. All are made in goodness and flourishing and shalom in the image of God, but also all are tainted with sin, disobedience, and the fall. The most optimistic people, yes, At the same time, the most alert people, because it's not just a mistake, but a curse, the fall, tainting every single one of us in all of who we are and the relationships that we build and the society that we build. Now, let's press into that alertness a little bit more, and this leads to my next point, enmity. The nature of this curse and the nature of what is happening here, the fall, we see here 
enmity. Verse 15, read with me there. Starting off here, I will put enmity between you. This is God continuing on in his pronouncement of the curse. Now first to the serpent, right? I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, Eve. But now it gets deeper, it gets longer. The ramifications go even bigger and wider. And your end between your offspring and her offspring. The things that come out of you and come out of her. What this text doesn't mean uh, is this, and let me just clarify this real quick to know that there's got to be more to this than just a snake and a woman. Okay? How many of you are scared of snakes? How many of you men are scared of snakes? Okay, myself included. Okay? So this can't mean that this is the reason why women have particular uh, fear against snakes. But part of unpacking that reality is also this reality. The heart of this is capturing the biblical concept of federal headship, corporate representation, an individual, a one, representing a greater whole. And that is what is happening here. It is not just to the serpent who happened to be there. It is not just to Eve who happened to be there. But what is being pronounced, the effect of all of this, what this means for all, is between your offspring and your offspring, your descendants and your descendants, to all. The ramifications that are flowing out because one is representing the whole, the federal headship of the evil one in the serpent, the Satan, the forces of, 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 of badness, if you want to call it that, the evil in this way, and goodness. So simply put, simply put, there will be enmity between good and evil. There will be enmity between the offspring of the good, offspring of the evil. There will always be the spirit in this life because we are all created and yet fallen, right? Genesis 1, 2 and Genesis 3, we are all created and yet fallen because of that. There will always be the force of againstness. There will always be the spirit of personal, relational, national, cultural, societal conflict that are within us, around us, above us, in our systems. Life on earth will always be filled with the spirit of and the force of againstness, enmity. I will put enmity between you and her and your offspring, her offspring. One of the ways that this life will be marked by is this, enmity. Think about social media, friends. Tim Keller recently made a cultural note on this, and I'll just kind of uh, summarize it here. He said something like this. We are increasingly becoming more familiar with this againstness, with this enmity, as we see strangers behind the screen going at it with each other. relishing in enmity, going at it with one another. And the danger here is that, one, we're becoming more aware of just how much enmity there is in this life and then maybe pent-up enmity, perhaps, more easily expressed because you are sitting behind the screen, perhaps. But the accessibility and the invisibility of social media is there for us to become even more aware of the fact that enmity is all around us, all within us. Here's another danger. Social media is not the proper place to then work out that enmity. Because you're not seeing somebody face to face. It's not effective for anyone involved. As a result, enmity grows and actually spills over into our lives It debilitates the way that we can actually work out our enmity amongst one another in person. We become more awkward. We become more avoiding of situations. And the most important point in all of this is this. Social media in and of itself then is not the origin of enmity. It's not the starting point of againstness. It's revealing and amplifying what has already been there. 
what is already residing in our hearts, in our relationship, it is amplifying those realities. And Christianity goes even further to say it is not just the recent phenomenon. It is not the pent-up enmity between one another in COVID or talks of racism. Christianity takes it up a notch even more to say it is from the beginning. This is the reality of Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3, that we ought to be most optimistic and yet we ought to be most alert, you see. We are of harmony. We have been created in harmony, and yet because of sin, enmity. What about the enmity in your lives, friends? What does that word mean to you in your life? As you're sitting there, as you're reflecting, perhaps it's the war happening in your own self against your own expectations, against your view of yourself. War in our relationships, friendships, your marriage. War in our culture, politics, society. Literal wars internationally. You can see then how the curse of Genesis 3, 14, the content of enmity that, is, that, it, that didn't get brought up because of social media, from the very beginning, it is ingrained in every personal, relational, cultural, societal parts of all of who we are. You can catch on to that. We can see how dis- just how destructive that it may be. It's not the result of just one mistake that we need to correct. But the problem may be much bigger than we might realize. Now, let me complicate this even more, okay? My guess is as you hear enmity between the good and evil, as you think about your own life and what does this mean, I'm sure, because I did this myself, the natural impulse is to put you in the good side. Yeah, enmity, that's true. That, that does describe a lot of what I'm going through because there's a lot of people, a lot of bad people out there a lot of the bad forces out there that are coming against me, the good one. Let me complicate this even more, okay? It's almost like a necklace. Have that visual in your mind right now. It's almost like a necklace that's been tangled up and it's impossible to untangle. You know what I'm talking about? Because you don't know where to start. You don't know where to start to untangle some of these things. So because of that, honesty means this. If we're really, really honest, the spirit of the serpent and the woman reside in all of us. Isn't that true? You are the one lied to, and you are the one who is lying to others. You are the one that's pained, and yet you are the one bringing pain to others. You are the one experiencing death in your life, and yet you are bringing death unto others. Hurt people hurt people. Triggered people trigger people. Isn't that true? The entangled necklace is that your life. You don't know where to begin. How do I unpack this? Where did this start? Can somebody give me a neat answer to why my life is the way it is or why my relationship is the way it is, why this nation is the way it is? It's like a necklace. You don't know where to begin because even if you don't like to admit it, we've been the recipient of this enmity. At the same time, we've all participated in it. That's the complicated, painful Necklace, entangled reality for all of us, individually, corporately, at every level. Again, we can take that even further, right? The relational setting, group dynamic setting, political setting, international setting, which makes sense that it doesn't just take then one political leader to then untangle this entire necklace, but that we are all longing for something greater, There's got to be something more. There's got to be something more powerful. Then where is our hope? Where can we turn to? 
What force can we join in with the saints of the old as we look at this passage here? Where can we turn to together, even in all of our waitings, even all of our Advent seasons of our lives? Promise. There's a promise. And there's a reason why this is called the first gospel, and thank God for it. Let's go back to verse 15 again. This is the good news. Continuation of of what I just read earlier, I will put enmity between you, enmity, right, enmity, between you and the woman, and even more, the ramifications flowing out between your offspring and her offspring. This will linger on for a while, right? And here's the proto-evangelion. Here's the first gospel. Here's the word of hope that comes in the middle of the pronouncement of curse, in the middle of it. He's not saying, let me see how you do. And if you shape up, if you can start to obey a little bit, okay, I'll give you a chance. While he is talking, while he is pronouncing the curse that is justly deserved for us, he utters this word of promise, prophecy, a word of hope. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Huh? <laughs> well, still, what does that mean? Think about this. Picture this, friends. A serpent wrapped around my leg, right leg, right now. And he has one purpose. He's trying to bite my heel. Perhaps it's a poisonous snake. Who knows? To bleed. To bleed out. To wound me. To bruise me. To strike me. To curse me. To crush me. These are all uh, the translations of Genesis 3.15 if you read other translations bruise, uh, curse, uh, 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 a crush, wound. But what the serpent doesn't know in that moment as he is wrapping around my leg, going for my heel, that I am stomping on his head. His head is being crushed as he is doing so. Do you get the picture? What the serpent meant, what the snake meant for evil, God meant for good. That reality. He shall bruise your head, the offspring of the woman. He is crushing down on your head. You are dead. You are dying. And you shall, the serpent, the offspring of the serpent, you shall bruise his heel. I'm stepping on his head to bruise, to crush him in that very act of what the serpent believes is a deadly blow to me. Does that sound familiar, friends? Many, 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 many years later, on the cross, a controversial Jewish rabbi who proved himself to be more than just a teacher, a rabbi, a promised savior has come. The Messiah died while that death, in one sense, was a defeat. Yes, it was a bruise to the heel. Yes, he went down. He died. Yes, at the same time, little did we know it was that death that would bring death to all death. Amen? It was that death that the curse was reversed. Genesis 3.15 is then for being fulfilled. He shall bruise your head, the offspring of the woman, and you shall bruise his heel. You think that you are taking him out. But embedded in that reality, you are done, Satan. Do you see that? That's the beautiful picture, the prophecy, the first gospel that is being presented to us, not much later down the line as God monitors our obedience, but in the middle of the curse, in the middle of the curse, I got you. I am for you. I have a plan for you. You can untangle this necklace yourself. I will come through the offspring of the woman. He shall bruise your head. He shall crush your head when you think that you are crushing his. That beautiful, ironic, upside-down, brutal, ugly, bloody scene of victory that comes through death. That's what's promised here. The unfolding of Scripture, as Alec Moria actually said in the beginning, right? The unfolding of the rest of Scripture is what is happening in Genesis 3.15. Can, can you see that? 
The tension of the Old Testament and the scripture as a whole is being unfolded as we look at the reality of Genesis 3.15. Well, who is this individual? Who is the offspring of the woman? I mean, think about Adam and Eve. They probably thought it was Cain because that was the first offspring, right? And that didn't work out. And then the momentum of scripture moves forward. All of Old Testament moves forward with this momentum to anticipate the coming of the one who is going to be this offspring. And God reiterates that again to Abraham, through your seed, through your offspring, the nations will be blessed. Well, okay, what is that going to be like? You keep going on and you keep tracking with the story. Then will it be Moses? Will it be Joshua? Will it be the nation of Israel? Will it be the judges? Will it be the kings? Will it be King David? The forward momentum of Scripture pushes us through. The tension is being built. And we see that there is a second Adam coming in Jesus. And listen to this in Romans 5, 9. For as by, one, uh, for as by the one man's disobedience, Adam, the first federal head, the corporate representative, the many were made sinners, the offspring. So by the one man's obedience, Jesus, our second and greater Adam, the new federal head, the many will be made righteous. The invitation then is for us to cling to the offspring of the woman who crushed the head of the serpent. That's the promise, and that's what we can see from the very beginning, Genesis 3. Now, what does this mean for us then in our advent, in our waiting? Have you seen the movie Titanic? In one sense, the entire thing is Rose Dawson, right? That's her name, the character. Flashback, retelling the story. That's the entire three hours, right? Captured in that story. And as she is telling the story, then you can imagine the crew is there listening to that story. And the entire movie is then unfolding what that scene is like as we go to the very end of when she is done telling the story, oh, that's the entirety of it. But the crew is then listening to Rose talk about the experience. They're tuning in. What happened here? What is your story? Are they wondering what the end is like? Ooh, like, is this person going to die? Or serve? Well, the, the person who is surviving is the one who's telling the story, right? They're not worried that she is going to die or what the ending will be. They're tuning into the story because there is the, the, the content of the story and what she is telling in that moment is one of love, romance, class, the rich and the poor, desperation, life, and death, all of these ingredients are compacted in this story that she is telling, and they are being drawn in. They know the ending. They know that the ship sunk. They're not hanging on to that, and yet they're paying attention to the story. In some ways, that's how we ought to engage in the narrative and the story that is being unfolded in front of us. Friends, the victory is already won. She's already there. She survived to tell the story. The victory is already won. Genesis 3.15 has already come. The offspring of the woman has already come in Jesus, and he demonstrated what this upside-down, ironic victory would look like. Bruising of the heel, bruising of the head. And yet we can journey along in that story, wait in that story, because unlike the crew paying attention to Rose, we have a different kind of waiting for us as Christians, living in this time of the already but not yet. And what is that waiting? We're not merely just waiting for the offspring of the woman to come because he's already come, but we're turning around, waiting for him to come back again. And as we do so, the ingredients for our waiting then is this, in this Advent season. And this is the reminder that I want us to take away as we leave here, that we can wait with confidence and we can wait with patience. 
We can wait with confidence knowing that he has already come. The victory has already been achieved. And yet we can wait with patience because it is that God, it is that offspring who says, I will come again and I will finish what I started. Friends, in your life, are there wars in your life? Are there things that you are holding on to, the tensions that you are holding on to, things that you don't understand, things that are breaking down, that have broken down, deadly things that have been done to you, that you are participating, wars that are happening within your own heart? What does it mean for, for, for me to then financially recover in, in, in this season? What does it mean for me to then get over this relationship? What does it mean for me to look ahead for what is coming next? The wars that are happening in your life. The wars are happening in your relationships. Will this get any better? Will there be true reconciliation between me and my brother, me and my sister? Will there be hope for this nation? What seems like an impossible line to cross from the right to the left or whatever the case might be. Will there be hope? The reality of Genesis 3.15. The promised one who has already come and said, I will come again. I will finish what I started. Means that, friends, we ought to be the most optimistic kind of people, and yet we ought to be the most alert people, that we wait with confidence, and yet we also wait with patience. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That we can all sing that together, that we can sing joy to the world. The Lord has already come. Yes and amen. We can sing that in our Advent season because he has already come. That's our waiting. At the same time, we are singing right away, turning around. Come, come, O oh Lord. Emmanuel, come again to us. Deliver us. Finish what you started. Restore for good. Friends, may that be our prayer in your own experiences of wars in your life, in your relationships, whatever you are going through, whatever you are questioning about the reality of this life. Friends, I urge you to look to the promise that came from the very beginning, Genesis 3.15. While he is pronouncing the righteous curse that we deserved, he says, I got you. I have a plan of redemption for you. Believe and trust in that kind of God who is for you from the beginning. He is not monitoring you to see, let me see where he will go. Let me see where she will go. And then I will bring the blessing to you. The victory has already been won. He has already come. And he will come again. May we put our waiting hope and confidence in the promised Messiah, in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this promise of hope, a word of hope that came in the middle of a curse that we rightly deserved, that this world rightly deserved, that you would somehow use mankind yet again to bring redemption and restoration, the offspring of the woman. as we track with the narrative of the story of Christianity, story of your heart for us, redemption being unfolded throughout the rest of Scripture that is captured in Genesis 3.15. Lord, we wait with confidence. We wait with hope and patience that you are a good God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Though there are so many things in the lives of many of my brothers and sisters here who are waiting patiently for everything they are praying through, for this enmity to go away, for this war to subside in their hearts, in their relationships, in the world around us. Father, help us not to lose sight. Help us not to lose our hope that has already been achieved by the cross, the bruising of the heel, the upside-down, ironic win that you have already achieved on our behalf. Genesis 3.15 is already achieved, already come. Help us to look back to that Savior who has already come and to patiently long for him to come again when he will wipe away all of our tears, 
when true and true reconciliation will be made available for all, that we would wait excitedly, alertly with all of that in mind. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Let me pray us. Let me continue in our prayer of tithes and offering. Lord, in the same manner, we pray uh, for you to loosen our grip of money and our finances to be able to give. The wars that are happening, even in the way that we manage money, that it can easily take us over, that it could easily be our God that seems to promise our flourishing. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to have the ultimate hope and the confidence in the one who has already delivered the victory. And out of that, Lord, may we be participants of your kingdom, even through our tithes and offering. We thank you for even the opportunity, even as we are celebrating Thanksgiving or spending time with family and friends, the ways that you have given us way more than we deserve and we need. Help us to give generously to those around us and the needs that are being met. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand and let's sing together this Christmas song that he has already come. And while we're singing, that we are longing for this coming to come again in Jesus. Let's sing together, friends. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appears and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. 
at first Advent Sunday of this season, before you go, uh, would you receive this good word, this benediction? Uh, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the offspring of the woman who has come to save us, and the love of our Father who has given us this promise, the first gospel from the very, very beginning in Genesis 3. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who reminds us to then hope with confidence and with patience as we are in this already but not yet. Come, Lord, again, Jesus, that we will say this in confidence together. May this God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go in peace. The prayer team will be here to pray with and for you as we end as well. Go in peace. Jesus came for man's redemption.